We are so thankful that you're here, thankful that the Lord is uh, building this church. We're going to be in, in Matthew this morning. I want to catch up on a few things. We, we've got a, a night of worship coming up in the month. If you're not, we're actually run, about to run separate um, marketing for this because we have, we have this idea. We've got people that we know that uh, might not come to a night of worship but might come to a concert. So if you get a couple of different flyers going, that's the same thing. It's just pointing at it from different angles. We want to have people come that are, that are maybe not always at church on a Sunday. Or if they say, hey, come to a night of prayer, they're going, yeah, sign me up for that. We know that some people are distant from that. So we're going to try to do our best to appeal, get some folks in here that maybe don't know the Lord, maybe haven't ever had an encounter with the Lord. Um, this morning we're in this series called Prayer 101. And I don't, want to, I don't want to go too fast this morning. I want, to, I want to review a little bit to catch you up from where you were last week. Because if we do, you'll miss out on some things. It's kind of building on last week. We looked at Matthew chapter 6, and we talked about this tension. And I used the illustration of a guitar, that a guitar has all these strings that are held in check by, uh, by tension. By their, there's this beautiful tone that comes out because of the tension. If the guitar strings are all loosened... There's no, there's no beauty in it, but there's this tension in it. And so we, I, I built this chart for you because we're talking about this idea of prayer. And on the left, and I'm going to go quickly because we went over it in, in depth last week, but on the left is this idea, not, not all the way, pull back two slides. Take the happy face away. Okay, on the left, we're not happy yet, is the idea that God's will happens regardless of how men and women pray. And that's, that's basically a Calvinistic thought. You may not be a theologian type person. You may be like, hey, I've never read a theology book, but some of us are, um, and so... This explains that, the idea that God's going to do what God wants to do. And we see this in nature. Like, we, we see this all the time. Like, um, nobody was praying for creation to happen. That, that's probably the best illustration. God just does what God wants to do. And God has the full right to do what God wants to do, by the way. That's one of the privileges of being God. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very elite club. He can do whatever he feels like doing. And on the other side is this Arminian thought, and it's that, that God's will toward us is largely based on how we pray. Because here, here's what we also see. We see in Scripture where God, he, he does things in accordance to how we pray. Do you all see that? So we see both these things, and if you go to one side or the other and stay there, you're, you're missing out on how things really are. And so I, I put a happy face for us to kind of be in the middle, and this is the tension that we live in. And in your life, if, if you're not a person who is praying, or you're praying and not seeing things done as you wish them to be done, you're, you're missing out on this beautiful tension. There are times when you pray, and it's right in line with God's will, and he answers that prayer like on that day. It's wonderful. It's, 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 a, it's a boost to your faith, right? You're like, oh, I prayed this morning and then this afternoon. I love it when you, you pray something and then you see the thing answered and you realize God started answering the prayer before you prayed it. Like, blows your mind. Like, God started putting things in place to answer your prayer before you even lined up your request. And that's because he's God and he can do what he wants to. But there's other times you pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and nothing happens as you see it. And so there's a tension there. And that's okay because it says in Scripture that we have to have faith. Faith being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see, Hebrews 11. 1. So we're in that, that little tension spot. And, and the, the background of this truth is that we, we believe that God is always at work around us. We have that quote from Henry Blackaby, that God is always at work around us. So whether you're praying or not, when you're praying, you're getting in line with God's spirit, you're, you're learning what he's, he's doing. But even if you're not praying, I would say this to you, God is still moving, God is still changing hearts, God is still doing stuff. We're not, we don't think that God is limited by our lack of prayer. People have said that. I'm like, what a silly thing to think that that ant controls where I go and where I step in my life. And we're less than the ant. He's bigger than us. The gap is larger. So God's always worked around us. We, we ended up last week with a prayer that we asked you to pray. Some of you guys have this orange card. that says, Father, throughout the entire day, everything I do, say, attempt, think, and imagine is going to be done under your eyes. You're going to be with me. You see everything. You know everything. There's nothing I can do or attempt that you are not fully aware of at all. Because you know all things. You also know my motivations. God, help me to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope some of you guys prayed this this week. And with the idea that, that our goal for this week was to be more aware of God's presence. It's not that, that he needs to show up more. It's that we need to, to recognize him more. We need to recognize the small things in life that, that God is moving, the, the, the changing of your heart, the changing of conversations, that the Lord is, is ushering you, walking with you, drawing you, pulling you in to more of, of him. We finished the scripture last week, Matthew 6, 7, and 8 says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret 
will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they will think that they'll be heard for their many words. And then it goes into this, this thing that we have all called the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember saying it as a child? Maybe in church, maybe you went to a, a, a Christian school or a school that had catechisms. And here, I was reading something this week about it, and it's, it's kind of misnomer because one of the, or misnamed, one of the, the parts of this prayer says, and forgive us our sins. And there's a, a theologian, a guy named John MacArthur, who says that um, we don't really need to, it's not best called the Lord's Prayer because Jesus would never need to pray that prayer because Jesus was holy and, and sinless and pure. But it's better called the disciples' prayer or the thing, the way Jesus is teaching us to pray. See, in Luke 11, it says Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospels that tell the story of Jesus' life firsthand. And so you've got different accounts from different angles, and they all agree. They've got different little tidbits they do. Luke focused on details. So it's not surprising he would give the precursor. You know, another place to say, when they fed a lot of people, and Luke would be like, we fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, on a certain hill, and it was noon. It was bright outside. The other guys were like, it was just a day. So Luke's the physician, the, the specific guy. But this sets up this, this prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, or better call the Disciples' Prayer. I'm going to read it to you. This is Matthew 6. Jesus then said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Martin Luther said that is the scariest phrase in the whole Bible. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So my plan this week was to teach through the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to go, there's six petitions in it. Three are from man to God. Three, the last uh, three, four, five, and six are from man about themselves it's very, uh, it, it reflects the, the Ten Commandments, which the first commandments are about how we should honor God. The other one's about how we should honor each other. It's also very reflective of the, when Jesus, when they say, what's the, the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God as, your, as only, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then he said, love your neighbors yourself. And I got two words into this thing. That's all I got. Couldn't get any further uh, because it's so, it's so full. It's so meaningful. It's so applicable and I want you just to say the words, our Father. Say, our Father. Say it like he's sitting in front of you. Our Father. That's all I got. I couldn't, I couldn't get past those words. I want to give you some background of, of why these words matter so much. And actually, they're so important, I actually typed up some notes. I don't type notes up. That's not how I'm wired. Uh, in seminary, we had to preach a, a manuscript sermon, which is where you type every word. Peter, did you ever have to do this in seminary? You have to preach a, a manuscript sermon. Peter's my, Peter and Stephanie are my friends from Switzerland, by the way. I get the, the, we get the, the furthest visitor award this morning. They were on their honeymoon in North Carolina. I'm like, why did you come to North Carolina from Switzerland? But they have family, and they're this horrible thing that we bring called hurricanes, and so now they're our guests this weekend. But we've known each other a long time. But manuscript sermons are where you, um, you write out all the words, word by word, jokes, hesitations, stalls, and I'm completely incapable of that. So my manuscript sermon, and I, I guess I lied in seminary, I preached the thing, had the video of it, and I went back and I typed out what I preached. Completely opposite of what the goal of the thing was. And my professor, I think he just knew it, but he liked me, and so I got an A on it. But anyway, so I typed up some notes for you. It says, in fact, God in the Old Testament is referred to Father 14 times in 39 books. Why don't you listen to this? The whole Old Testament Larger in size than the whole New Testament, but 14 times. And even then, it was impersonal. In those 14 occurrences of the Father being used, it was never referred to as individuals. Now you're going, what does this matter? Just, just hang with me. It was only referred to the nation of Israel. You can search from Genesis, in the beginning God, to the end of Malachi, which is the last minor prophet in the Old Testament, and you'll not find one individual speaking to God as God the Father like we have the idea of God the Father. Think about this. This is the story of God unveiling himself, revealing himself, showing redemption to humanity, and he hadn't let them into who he is yet. Like, they know God's the great I am. We love these words. 
And that great I am is, is, is all that and some more. So in Jesus' day, the, the people, the theologians of the time had focused on God's sovereignty, his transcendence, like how high and lofty he was. That they had even been careful never to repeat. He had a covenant name, and we only had consonants, Y-H-W-H. We don't know, but they, they said it was Yahweh or Jehovah. And they would even be careful when they would say his name. He was so far, so distant, and so scary that they had to even invent a name to not misrepresent his real name. Think, think about the distance of that. So this distance was guarded. When Jesus came to the scene, he, he did something very interesting. He addressed God only as Father. Only. So four to 6,000 years of precedent of God Almighty, God sovereign, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah this, Jehovah that. And Jesus rolls on the scene and says, Abba. There's only one time in the Gospels alone, Jesus referred to God as his Abba Father 60 times. The whole Old Testament, 14 times. Jesus rolls in, and he's trying to change. He's bringing this new wine we sang about this morning. New wine is the gospel, by the way. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But new wine is the gospel that you can't put this new, fresh thing in these old skins. Jesus was the new skin, literally the new skin, the incarnation of God. So he comes in, and he starts dropping the name Abba. And if you're a bent-up Pharisee, Sadducee, caught up in the law, it's the most offensive thing to say. That guy can say, Abba, Father. And Jesus doesn't do it once, twice, 60 times we have record of. Most likely, he said it hundreds and thousands of times. Luke said there's no, not enough books on the planet to record all the things this great man did. I think Jesus was like a jab. God's my Father. God's my Abba. Boom, Abba, Abba, Abba. And they, he could see them fuming over it. And I love it. I love that he brings this new relationship, this new opportunity, this new access to God simply by a four-letter Aramaic, four-letter Aramaic word said, Abba. Nobody in Israel had ever prayed like Jesus did, and he brought this new thing on. One time in the Gospels, when Jesus is on the cross, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, he refers to God in his former name because he's quoting Scripture. And even then, he honors the scripture by not misquoting it. Every other single time, it was my Abba, Father, my Abba, Father. To the traditional person, Jesus' prayer was revolutionary. Fourteen times the Old Testament referred to Father, God, who was still far off, scary, and distant. And even then, it was about a corporate prayer of God the Father to the nation of Israel. And Jesus comes in. And says over and over again, you are our Abba, Father. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches that you can approach the Lord because of him, because of Christ. But you have this access called Abba. I want to teach about that this morning. I hope hope you'll listen. The word Abba means Papa, but it's not as informal as our word for Papa. It's It's like if we said, this is very formal. It almost sounds like Charles Dickens kind of language, our dearest Father. So we've got this idea that God the Father in the Old Testament was scary, far off, holy, 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 and he is. And then this Abba seems like he's real, so he's personal and yet still high and lofty. It's like you were saying, our dearest Father. So first thing I want you to think about when you say addressing God as Abba is not just an indication of our spiritual health, but it it marks the authenticity of our faith. I I want you to think about that. There's a verse that says in Galatians, and because you're sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. So when you become a believer, when God fills you with the Spirit, one of the first things that it reproduces is you are able to call on a new relationship. Our hope this month is that you'll, you'll tie into this idea that you have access to God, that you can, you can speak to Him, you can listen to Him, that He's not on your own, He's far off, but because of Christ, He is now near. So Galatians says that. And then in, in Romans 8, it says this. It says, For you do not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear. So before, that's the old idea that God was far off and scary. And now it says this, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So so God's spirit is verifying, validating that you're not not the way it was anymore. So here's the, the question I want us to think about as we talk about this today. 
Are you fully exercising your, your access to God? Are you living and reflecting and walking around as if you have connection to him? In John, it says this, But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. My, my children have unique access to me that nobody else on the planet has. They have more grace from me. They have more, they can mess up more, and I will forgive them more than any other person on this planet. Because I know where they are in life. I know who they are. And the scripture says that we have been given the right to become children of God, which is why we can start our prayers with this idea of saying, Abba, Father. J.I. Packer, had he said this way. This is a great theologian. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God, let that sit on you for a minute. Now, here, here's the problem. God has uniquely put fathers in the world to represent him. That's the problem. It's the beauty. It's also the problem. There's that tension because here's the thing. Not everybody, when you say father or papa, have a really good representation of God. And we know that. And we don't gloss over that. We don't say, just get over it. Just look at somebody else's dad. We know that. We know that deep down. So here, here's what I believe. I believe that today we need to have a little reinventing of who God the Father is. Because some of us, that picture has been so um, misrepresented because we haven't had a good picture of him. And here's the good news. God doesn't necessarily have to have a human representative to change your heart. So here, what does this Abba child relationship produced. So we're the, we're the children. We've been brought in. We've been issued an invitation. We've said yes to the Lord, and, and we're going into this new relationship with an Abba. He's not God the Father only that's far away anymore. He still is that God. He's still the Holy, Holy, Holies. He is still, uh, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Ark represented his, his presence. It had his physical presence, and they were carrying on these poles because you couldn't even touch the Ark because it had his presence in it. And somebody tripped one day, and a man, out of reverence, which is, this has always bothered me because I never understand this completely, out of reverence, the man reaches down to try to stop the Ark from falling, and because he was an unholy person touching a holy God, he was killed instantly. And it bothers me, I don't understand that, but I do know this. It means that that guy in the Old Testament needed Jesus too. Because though, although God is still our Abba Father, we have this access. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father. He said it every time, Abba. Nobody comes through the Abba except through me. So Christ is that asbestos of grace that keeps us from dying when we encounter God's holy presence. We don't even understand this. We don't, we're just, we, don't, we don't get this yet. But this Abba-child relationship should produce a few things. I want to tell you, number one, it should bring a sense of being loved. When you think about Jesus bridging the gap between God the Father and you, it should make us just stop and say, wow, I am I'm desperately loved. I found a story of a missionary named Everett Fulham who was a missionary to a tribe of people in Nigeria. I want to say how isolated these people were. They had never heard the term Africa. They didn't even know the continent that they were on, much less the idea of America. They had a pagan, pre-scientific view of, of creation. It was so simple that when the missionary mentioned to the chief that their Americans had walked on the moon, look at this, the old chief looked in his face, then up at the moon and exclaimed in an angry tone, there's nobody up there, besides it's not big enough for two people to stand on. Because think about it, how big is the moon if you're standing here? It's like, covered it up. So they don't understand it. They're like, the moon's too, too small. These people are like, just like cavemen in terms of their science, Okay. He had no idea of how the size of the moon or distance from the earth, but there in the forgotten wilds of West Africa, this missionary had an experience he recorded to, to prove how God's love even can bridge that gap. This missionary, Everett Fulham, had led three of these people to Christ. And I don't know how you preach Jesus 
People who don't even know the continent they're on. And somehow God gives words. This guy's preaching. I could just imagine him giving these words. And he baptized these three people. And this is what he says. There were two men, and this is out of his diary. There were two men and one woman. We stood on the bank of a muddy river, wet and happy. I'd never seen three more joyful people. And I asked them in their tongue, what is the best thing about this experience? All three continued to smile, the glistening water emphasizing the brightness of their dark-skinned faces. I want you to see their quote, but only one spoke in clear English. This is what he said. Behind this universe stands one God, not a great number of warring spirits as we had always believed. Look at this. But one God, and that God loves me. We believed in multiple things before we came to Christ. But the scriptures say, and these really good testimonies says, there's one God. And to think that he loves us. In 1 John, he uses this phrase, he goes, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. We don't use the word lavish much, do we? What does lavish imply? Over the top generosity. Not not just enough love to get you by. The great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. There's a theologian that said it this way. He says, though we are incomplete, God loves us completely. Though we are imperfect, he loves us perfectly. Though we may feel lost and without compass, God's love encompasses us completely. He loves every one of us, even those who are flawed, rejected, awkward, sorrow, sorrowful, or broken. Isn't that good news? You know, we exist as a church because we believe there are people who are far from God. How many of you know one person far from God? We don't. Just watch people's lives. Watch the things they do to find peace, the things they do to make themselves feel better. And so if you said, Matt, what does Catholics exist? We exist so that people far from God can find life and liberty in Jesus. This guy said it because God loves every one of us, those who are flawed, rejected, awkward, sorrowful, or broken. We believe that. We believe the first thing people need to encounter is God's overwhelming, lavished love. Scripture says it's the mercy of the Lord that leads us to repentance. God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy, God's character, God's kindness. The way he it says in the Psalms, he doesn't treat us as if our sins deserve. Praise God for that. The second thing this should do, it should drive home the reality of our forgiveness. There's a wonderful story in, in Luke, the guy that was the physician. Luke chapter 15, and the whole chapter is about lost stuff. How many of you guys have ever lost something that made you crazy? Got some OCD kicking in. Our sister, Blair, and I have a sister named Kim. Some of you guys have met. One time she lost these little earrings that I think the total carrot weight was like one-sixteenth of a carrot. Like, like they were like the slivers that fell off of the real diamonds. The only thing that were diamonds about them is they remembered being touching the real diamonds, okay? And our grandparents had given them to my sister, and she was very nostalgic, everything about, you know, memories and things. And so one of them had the backing had fallen off, and it was... She was in her new home. It was getting ready for Christmas time. So there's like wrapping paper and all the gifts all over the place. And so she looks all night for this loss. If it's one, one 32nd of a carat diamond, a hint, a glimpse of a diamond. And she can't find it. And she collapses and puts her feet up on her couch and it rolls out of the cuff of her pants. She had carried the lost thing that she was seeking out like all night. And if you know my sister, it got like frenzied. Every, every hour it got to be a little bit more and more ecstatic. Of, Where's the diamond? Where's the diamond? Where's the diamond? Luke 15 is a story about how God is concerned about lost things. Talk about lost coins and lost sheep. And then the last, the summation of the chapter is this thing called the prodigal son. I want to I read it to you, let it, let it fresh, fresh wash. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate in in Jewish speak, this is basically saying, let's live as if you're dead already. Give me my share. We gloss it over because English is tidy, but this is like, as if you were dead, Dad, give me all my stuff. Now, how many of us would be happy with that as parents? None of us. Highly offensive. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him 
to his fields to feed pigs. For a Jewish person, feeding pigs is the lowest of the low. These are vile, unfit animals. And so this guy is in such a bad spot that his only job is to take care of, to serve vile, dirty animals. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he couldn't even beg a a pod from the pigs. He's in bad shape. Verse 17, then he came to a census. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still, next, but while he was, one more slide. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Abba, Jesus used the word father, Abba, Abba, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is a picture of God's love. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The gospel is this phrase. But while he was still a long way off. And if you don't get this, you don't get anything. Our whole faith is based on understanding that God is the one who redeems those who have wished he was dead. When the son said to the father, give me my inheritance, and the father does it, and it says he comes to his senses. That is a picture of our lives. The people you know that have, have in their mind, they've said, I can do this on my own. I can save myself. I don't need you, God. They, they balk at God being the author of creation. They, they mock his laws. They mock his truths. And yet God, in his redemptive nature, is still over there saying this. I'm going to coordinate things and arrange things. There are no circumstances in this world. I'm going to arrange things and line things up to break them on this side of death to get their attention. When he came to his senses, what he doesn't know is that the God of the universe was orchestrating things to get his senses. He's taking away all the good jobs. Let's get him low. Take, we're not going to let him feed donkeys, which have got a little bit of character to him. Let's let him feed pigs. And all these things got orchestrated to get this guy's attention. And then he says, I came to my senses. When God's drawing you, you don't come to your senses. You just notice the things that have been created to get you to your senses. And this is what happened. While, while he was still a long way off. You and I, if you're a person today who knows the Lord, who's felt God's calling on your life, who felt him call you to repentance, know this. God has called you. He has wooed you. He has drawn you to himself. And that should create this amazing sense of, Lord, I am forgiven and help me live a life that reflects that. The third thing this should do, it should bring us confidence, security, and wholeness into our lives. This, this idea that God has saved us should give you some, some peace and some hope. So here, here's how I want to I apply this for us. These words, our Father, should teach us how to pray in response to the gospel. Now, we talk about the gospel a lot here, but the gospel is this overwhelming new message that God has sent. When, when it says that in, in Isaiah, when it says that God is going to send his son, his name is going to be Emmanuel, which is another way of saying that that God is going to be with us. He's saying, that my son's going to come and he's going to sing a new song the world has never heard. I had a friend that, that wrote a book called The Singer. He's actually passed away now, but it was this, this epic poem about this world that was black and white with no color in it. And that the master creator had sent a messenger to come and sing a new song, and the messenger's name was The Singer. And wherever he sang, whatever, whenever he gave these new words from the creator, life and color came to the world. And his words literally would wash over this dark black and white landscape that would bring life and color. And it's it's a trilogy book. It's hundreds of lines in in poem form. And it's about Jesus bringing the gospel and singing the gospel over somebody's dark, black and white, lifeless existence. And in a very real way, that's what Christ did. He came into this world. He came into your world and he spoke life to you. And in 2 Corinthians, it says, For our sake, he, God made him, Jesus, I'm filling in the pronouns for you, 
to be sin who knew no sin. So in other words, God said, I'm going I'm to pour all my punishment on my son Jesus, although he doesn't deserve it. I'm going to pour on my son, and then it says, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. That's the whole good news. The good news is that you weren't good-looking and attractive, and you weren't reaching out for God and doing your own to be better. You were lost. You had forgotten. You, you didn't even forget. You didn't even know who God was. You were distant from him. And he said this, they don't even have enough sense to turn to me. Ephesians says that while we were dead in our sins, God loved us. We like to think we met God halfway. We didn't meet God halfway. We didn't have the capacity to meet him halfway. We were dead in our sins. We were, we were broken. We were far. We were distant. We weren't even looking toward him. And it says, but God poured on his son all that you and I deserve. So the first thing this should do for us, how do you make this practical? We can approach God with confidence. I want to say that to you again. You can approach God with confidence. Now, if you're not a believer, if you've never called on Christ, you cannot approach God with confidence yet. Now, you can call out to him because of Jesus, but you don't have that interpersonal relationship yet. Now, God is issuing the invitation to you. He would like to have you in the fold. He would like for you to be a part of his children, part of the elect. But you, you and I, if you're a Christ follower, if you've called on Christ, you have access. It says in Hebrews 4, this was written to a group of believers. It says, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Then it names the priest Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, or let us hold fast our beliefs. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And then it says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews is is this book written, we're explaining that there's a sacrifice and there's a sacrificer which is the high priest. And the high priest would go in a certain time and, and would make this sacrifice. And the book of Hebrews, the main point of it is that there's, those are both the same, that Jesus himself is the sacrifice. It goes back to the Old Testament law about there had to be a, a blood sacrifice to appease God's anger, to, to make people in, in right legal standing with God. The fancy word is the atonement. It means at one meant putting people back together with God, bridging that gap, getting things back in good relationship. And Hebrews says not only is there a good sacrifice in Jesus, but there's also a high priest in Jesus. He is the full picture. He does all sides of this equation, and he says because of Christ, because of the good sacrifice and the good high high priest, you now can have access, you can have mercy and grace because you can know God now because of Christ. People like to skip the Jesus piece and say, I just want to have access to God. You don't have access to God Unless it's through Jesus. So the first thing is we should approach God with confidence. Number two, we must pray with simplicity. Now, a lot of us don't start to pray or we don't like to pray in front of people because we're really scared about how our words are going to say. Now, unless you're just a mute, you shouldn't have fear in that. Because our prayers could simply be, God, we, we just need you today. Isn't that a good prayer? If I'm struggling, you call me and say, Matt, let me pray for you. I bow my head, or if I'm driving down the road, I bow one eye, you know, the holy driving thing, and, and you say, uh, God, would you just be with Matt today? I'll take that prayer all day long. All day long. Or God, would you give peace? Have some friends that were in a worship band, they were at a, a big church one time, big, huge church, like 30,000 people in this church, and they got in the back, it was like all the worship leaders, and the pastor said, let's pray, and they bowed their heads, <laughs> and the pastor said, do it again, Lord. Amen. And they were expecting this like, thou wast Lord in heaven, you know, blah, 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 blah. Do it again, Lord. Amen. I like that. I think we'd do well to, to pray more like that. Do it again, Lord. Or God, I need you today. Or I'm still broke, Father. I'm still, still kind of wretched. I still need some grace. I'm st- I didn't say ratchet, kids. I said wretched. It's a Bible word. They're like, you said, no, I didn't say that. I'm smarter than that, sorry. Um, We should pray simply. There's a a guy that uh, is actually Billy Graham's grandson that says this. He says, legalism says God will love us if we change or if we use the right words. The gospel says God will change us because he loves us. Let me say that to you again. Legalism says God will love us if we change. The gospel says God will change us if because he loves us. And you got to get the difference between these two. One of them Living one way of I've got to be perfect, I've got to pray the right words, I've got, to, I've got to act and live so that God can move in my life means you're going to be frustrated and burnt out. You're never, going to, you're never going to be good enough for God apart from Christ. You can't. 
You can't. And if you say you can, you're just ignoring you. You're ignoring me. We are highly, we have an incredible capacity to let God down. Do y'all know that? Do you feel that? Martin Luther would spend hours confessing his sin. He would, he would sleep on a, a, a stone cot, like they carved into this wall, this, this little resting. He would, he would not take his, his mattress. He would sleep on it. He would make sure it was wet and damp and cold. And he would beat himself trying to confess his sins. And he realized, I don't have enough memory. I don't have enough mental capacity to remember all the things I've done. He said, wretched man, am I. I can't, I can't say I'm sorry enough. I can't repent enough. And the church at the time was really distant from the word of God. They were, they were saying that only certain people could handle the word of God. And he wanted to know God enough that he had, he had learned the languages and gone through all the hoops to be able to look at the word of God. And he was reading it. And the thing he saw in Romans was very different than the thing being acted out. And he saw there was freedom because of Christ in the Bible. He saw there was forgiveness because of Jesus, not because of our actions, not because of our words, not because of our, I checked all the boxes. And he realized the freedom for his life came through Christ and Christ alone. And for us today, I would tell you this, you can live your life and say, I'm going to be good. A lot of our churches growing up taught morality. Just do this and pray this way and say these things and don't, you know, don't drink smoke or date girls that do. And you're like, okay, check, check, check. And don't get tattoos. Woo! And you get a tattoo, you're like, I must be hellbound because I got the mark. You know? and, and you don't know what to do then. You've you already failed God. So I won't ever come back to him because I've already failed him. Why would I even try now? And then Jesus busts up on the scene and says his name is Abba. He's not that far off, distant God anymore because I brought him near to you. Jesus said bold things that were like, if you want to know what the Father looks like, look at me. i got to tell you something. If you're not God alone, that is heretical. I mean, there's no middle ground. People go, Jesus was a good man. He was either a raving lunatic. C.S. Lewis, great mind, says he's either liar, lord, or lunatic. And C.S. Lewis says he's not a liar because people died for their belief in him. Psychologists, psychiatrists have studied his words, his teaching. They've said it's the most amazing, calm, collected words ever. He's not a lunatic. He's got to be Lord. And the gospel says because he's Lord, we've got to listen to his words. And his words say things like, come to me all who are weary and heavy burden, I'll give you rest. And the third thing this, this idea of Abba should do is it should help us to pray with love for our Papa. And a lot of us don't even know what a good father on this side of heaven looks like. Brennan Manning in the book Ragamuffin Gospel, which I highly encourage everybody to read it, is an amazing book. I've probably given away 50 copies of it. He said, we should be astonished at the goodness of God, stunned that he should bother to call us by name, our mouths wide open at his love, bewildered that at this very moment we're standing on holy ground. We should be astonished at the goodness of God. As I was praying this week, there's a question that God kept putting on my mind, and I I just want to ask you this, and this has got to be one of those things you think on, that you let it simmer in your heart. Have you gotten over the gospel? Because there was a day, if you called on Christ, at least a glimpse of this gospel, you saw that you were dirty, and you were far off, and you were stubborn, and you were hell-bound, And you were not able to follow God on your own and be right because of yourself. And you realize the need for a savior. You realize the need for someone to step in the gap. And at that point, if there was a true conversion, you said to him, God, will you take all of me for all of you? And you were astonished. Maybe you weren't 100% astonished. Maybe you were 30%, but maybe you just saw a glimpse. I don't think any of us could ever see God as he fully is this side of heaven because it would just overwhelm us. But at that moment, you saw the gospel, but the problem is we forget how good the gospel is. We forget when we don't pray that we, don't have, that we have access to God. The gospel says it, it, God desires for us to be clean and, and our lives to be changed as an overflow, but it never says you've got to clean up on your own to have access to him. Christ, this is a mind-blowing. We, we confess our sins. God forgets our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. And the freedom of that gives us access to him, which gives us strength and power and liberty to follow him. It's mind-blowing. Because our human nature says, if I earned a C in class, I get a C, right? And Jesus says, well, you need an F double minus, but because of my perfection, I'm giving you an A plus with all the bonus points. That's that's the gospel, and we don't get it. We don't understand it. 
Last verse for today, and we're going to be done. I, I, our goal is that we'll, we'll pray together today. That we'll pray for our hearts and, and, and say, God, please don't let me get over this gospel. There's a verse in Zephaniah that says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with his loud singing. In my mind, I'm, I'm looking at the prophet Zephaniah. And remember, God is called God the Father, God the Holy of Holies, God the scary one. But there's still glimpses. In the Old Testament, the Abba Father coming. Isn't this Abba Father kind of speak? This is, he will quiet you with his love. He will sing over you with loud singing. If you don't know the Lord today, if you've never confessed your need for Christ, then the first thing to do is for you to say, God, do I know you? Have I, have I ever entered into that place with you? If I confess my sins, if I confess that I can't save myself, if that's you, we're going to be down here praying some of us. We would love to share how you can enter into a relationship with him. It's going to be kind of scary. You're going to have to get up and walk down, but we'd love to do that for you. Or maybe the person that invited you today, maybe talk to them afterwards. We're not in such a hurry. We can't stop and talk to you. But the vast majority of us who we've talked about this together, you're in a spot where maybe, maybe you've just forgotten that you have access. Maybe you've forgotten that God the Father has given you an entry to him through his son, Jesus. And I don't want us to get over the gospel this week. I want us to be all caught up in the gospel. I want it to be in our talk and in our speech and in our small groups and in our, in our marriages and with our children, the way we discipline and, 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 and raise and direct our kids because the gospel says that God loved us in spite of us. He loves us too much to leave us there and he invites us to a new life full of hope in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, thank you that we can only say our Father. We, I, I, I couldn't get past that today. Lord, thank you that there's just volumes of truth. God, when we say our Father, it means we're saying this collectively. God, that we as a group, as a congregation, we need you. Lord, we need you to step in. We need you to move. We need you to draw hearts. We need you to help us to be healthy. God, we need you to help us to, to honor you with the, the way we live, the way we interact. And when we say, Father, it means that we have, we have this access to you that maybe we don't exercise like we should. Maybe we're, maybe we're ignoring this call into relationship. And, but, Father, right now I pray for people that maybe have, have treated you as the Old Testament picture of you. God, you didn't change. You just were revealing more and more about yourself to us. But, God, maybe some of us are caught up in that old picture of who you were. And, God, maybe this morning you want to let us see there's a, there's a bigger, broader picture of who you are and how you want to know us and I just pray God for us that this altar would be full as we talk to you whether it's our seats or at the front God that we would just just invite you in to our lives God you're sovereign you can you can get in there but Lord I, I believe the way you interact with us is that sometimes you sit back and you wait for access for up from us I know you've ran into my life before but God sometimes you sit back and wait on me so we love you God, I pray you bless this time. I pray you bless us as we sit and listen and sing and, and respond to this truth. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.